please have your, take your seats. Thank you very much for having me. It's really an honor and a privilege for me to be here today among fellow brothers and sisters who are eagerly awaiting the return of our Lord. And I hope you are, are as, ex, as excited as I am to, um, to live in these times. It's really a privilege to, to know that our Lord will soon be returning. And, I mean, it fills us with excitement. And, uh, you know, the, we are the only generation in the world to whom He has revealed information in such a way that we could understand the hidden meaning that He has hidden for us in His Word, which is such a privilege. I mean, no other generation before us, even Daniel said that, you know, he didn't understand the things that were shown to him when Gabriel sh um, showed him various visions and prophecies. And I'll get, I'll get to that as we go on. Um, maybe just before I begin, um, I think, depending on how long it will take me to get through these presentations, I can maybe allow for a bit of a, a question after, or a question session just after each of these, maybe just to, uh, so people don't forget what we were speaking about, you know, in each of these sessions, uh, depending on the time. Other, other than that, if there's not enough time available, we will have uh, a question session, uh, a question and answer session at the end of the, uh, the three presentations, and I'm available until tomorrow morning, so if you really want me to sit with you and go through some of the things that uh, I'll be discussing today, I'll be more than happy to do that. And I think, you know, it's, it's really interesting what, what the Lord is revealing to us. Um, maybe, yeah, let's, let's get into this um, and see how it goes. Maybe before I start, just, just another question. How many have seen um, the videos known as on, on the channel, God's Roadmap to the End? Just want to see, get a feeling for how many people have seen them. So, I, okay, so it's not that many, but that's, that's good because there's a lot of good information that you will uh, encounter today. And I pray that the Lord will, will bless you with, with that information. Um, and I give all the glory for, uh, you know, for rev Him revealing this to us, to Him, obviously. Uh, I am just one of His pens in His pockets or that He writes with. And, you know, I'm a fallible person. I don't understand everything. Uh, so don't take my word for it. Take what I say like the Bereans did. Go and measure it against the word. My desire is just to share with you the wonderful news that, that the Lord has shared with me. And uh, I don't know why he's chosen me to do this, but, you know, I, I feel very privileged and honored that he did. Um, and it's really a privilege to share that information with you as well. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. I, I don't expect everybody to agree with me on everything that I say. All that I say is that whatever I say, measure it against the Word of God. If you find that there's a discrepancy, please point it out to me. I'm willing to change my opinion on, on everything as long as the, that opinion matches what the Word of God says. So my approach to the Word of God is always um, to reach an understanding where Whatever I believe um, matches all the passages that I can find in the Word of God concerning a specific understanding that I'm trying to achieve. So if I have a, a specific passage that contradicts something else that I've read in a different passage, I need to understand why uh, there's a contradiction between these two. So I will go into some of these examples today uh, and show you, you know, where there's apparent contradictions between passages and how when we, uh, you know, allow the Holy Spirit to, to open the Word to us, how we can then understand what, how this contradiction can be resolved into um, something that is complementary, you know. So, but I'll get to that. I don't want to, to go into too much detail at this point. There's a lot to, to discuss. Um, okay. How many of you know what this is? So if you, what, what would go through your minds if you woke up one morning and you saw on the news that Jupiter was impacted by another planet? Uh, I think the first thing that many people would do is to 
ask themselves, you know, is this not maybe April Fool's Day? But then, you know, when they realize it's not, it will still feel a bit unreal to realize that, you know, there was this impact between Jupiter and something else that nobody told us about. How did this happen? Why is this the only time that we find out about this? And uh, even at that point, it will still feel a bit unreal. Um, the, the other thing is also, you know, we've been told that Jupiter is a gas giant. So I will go into a bit of this as well, and some of the misconceptions about Jupiter in this respect. And did you know the Bible actually describes this event to us? Nobody's ever told us that either. But I will show you today how the Bible describes this event. And it's, it's quite exciting because it is also known as the sign of the Son of Man appearing in heaven that will show us his return. Um, so this is, the, this is a marker that the Lord has sent us and I will go into how the, the word shows us that this will actually happen this year. Um, even though you know, the, those in control of the media of this world does not want this information to, uh, you know, to be made known to people. I suppose to uh, not have people live in fear or you know, cause panic amongst the, the masses. Uh, but the Word of God shows this clearly, and I will show you. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite evident. So just before I get into too much detail, maybe just a little background about myself. So you know my name is Jakub Prinsler. Like I said, I'm fallible. i rather trust the word of God than what I say. Um, in, in all respects, you know, I only want to give honor to our Heavenly Father. So, um, you know, if you don't uh, agree with me, that is completely fine. I won't hold it against you. Um, what the, the things that I will, will convey to you today will probably be not be the, the normal uh, interpretation of the Word of God that you would normally hear. Um, I was born again at a very young age. I was two years old. I can actually remember the when I was lying in my uh, crib and I asked the Lord to, to come into my heart. You know, it was just my parents taught me what to pray and I was actually thinking about it when I, when I asked him to come in and I was wondering, is he now living in my heart? Um, and my father, when I was about four years old, he then sort of took an official, uh, took me, you know, through the official acceptance of the Lord and inviting him in. And that was normally the, what I explained to people when I, when I came to, uh, or when I invited the Lord into my life. But then, I think it was about four or five years back, when I was telling somebody about that, then the Lord told me, no, 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 uh, when you were two years old, remember, you were lying, <laughs> were lying in, the, in the crib and you asked me to come into your, into your life. And it's, it's so amazing to think that he sits and waits for us to, to, invite, uh, to, to invite him into our lives. And as soon as we do that, you know, and we give our lives over to him, he is more than happy to, to come into our lives and to be part of our lives. So that's, that's where I met the Lord. Um, I've had a pretty normal childhood. My, my parents... Um, provided a lot of input as far as knowing the Lord is concerned. Uh, so I was raised in a Christian home, lots of input with uh, regards to knowing our Lord and having a relationship with Him. Uh, when I was a teenager, I became interested in Bible prophecy, and I was always interested in understanding how what the events that are occurring in the world would relate to what was written in the Word of God as far as prophecies are concerned. So it was always, I was always looking for a matching connection between what was written in the prophecies and what we were seeing around us in the world. And I could never really find a, a solid connection between you know, what was written and what was happening. And I, I read a lot of prophecy books by many writers or various writers and, you know, I could never find their opinions. I could see there were certain truths that are coming out, but there was never something I could say, this is a, a solid match for what was written in the Word of God um, and what we were experiencing in the world around us. So I then went to study mechanical engineering. Um, 
I worked for a mechanical engineer basically for a year and a half and after that my career basically focused on uh, information systems, um, recognizing patterns and I think this is also what the, what the Lord used to prepare me for understanding what he wanted to reveal to me. And it was during my third year in university where I first had an encounter with the Lord where he spoke to me audibly and this was at uh, you know sort of a, in the mid mid exams through my third year uh, I was right or I wrote a maths exam and it didn't go that well I was I had flu I couldn't sleep for for two evenings before I wrote that exam so I didn't feel very positive about the outcome of that exam and I had to tell my parents who were planning a holiday whether I would be joining them or whether I would be remaining behind to do a, a re-exam. And I, I didn't know what to tell them because I didn't know what my results would be. And I was, I just asked the Lord, please Lord, I, I need to know what to, to tell them because I really want to go, but I don't want to, you know, if, if I didn't make this exam, then I've, I've got to do it again for another semester, which would, wouldn't be a, a wise decision if I just left without you know, knowing whether I should. So as I was trying to phone my parents, the phone was uh, engaged. So it, I think it, I tried about four or five times. And at the first time, it was just this voice inside me that said, if the phone rings on the next attempt, then you know you can go. Okay, so I tried again, and it rang. So I thought, okay, is, is this a coincidence, or is this the Lord speaking to me? And uh, as, I, as I was asking him to confirm his word to me, the, the old lady that I was uh, staying with in a, a boarding house, she, she was watching a, a soapy on the TV. And as I was asking the Lord, you know, can, I, can I trust what you've just shown me, or is this just a coincidence? And as I was asking that, he, uh, an actor on the soap, he said to, to another actor, you can go and enjoy it. <laughs> so, so, but this is not the end. <clears throat> so I decided, no, I'm going to trust the Lord in this. He's confirmed his message, and that's normally how he does it in his word as well. He will give you, uh, you know, two instances in which he will say, this is, this is what I've told you, and then he will confirm what he's, what he's done as well. So I went on the holiday. Um, I, you know, didn't worry about the, the exam after that. And when I came back after the holiday, I went to see my results. It was 49.5. So <laughs> he's actually given me a half percent extra as well for, for trusting him. And I think that was where the, the Lord um, taught me to, to really just fall back into his arms. You know, he's, he wants us to rely on him 100%. And I think that is when it comes to a point where, where we've got the most intimate relationship with Him, is when we can just say, Lord, You are, you receive all the glory. We've got nothing to offer. Um, you are worthy. We are just uh, giving You praise for who You are. And, and that is really what, what the Lord has taught me uh, in that instance. I mean, it's a simple, it's a simple thing, but it was, it's, it's a really important lesson that he, that he taught me. And I, th I think, especially as we move towards his return, it, it really makes a lot of sense to, to take this into account and to, and to focus on, you know, who he really is. And the fact that we, although we are his bride, we, you know, we have, we have no ability to, to provide him with anything that would impress him. You know, that, that's basically what I, what I would like to say. Um, it, is, it is all the glory is, belongs to him. We are just there to bring him glory and to cast the crowns that we are able to earn for him uh, before his feet. Um, <clears throat> so during my work career, as I said, I worked with a lot of data and pattern recognition. And this is, I think, also part of how the Lord prepared me for the information that he would like or that he uh, decided to share with me, to share with others. Um, and as I said, I always loved biblical prophecy. And in the 1990s, uh, the late, late 1990s, I, uh, my uncle, who is a minister in a church as well, gave me a, 
uh, book to study uh, or to read. And, and this was uh, by a person that's not really very well known. It's a Russian mathematician. His name was Ivan Benin. I don't know who, if, 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 if any of you have heard of him. But <clears throat> he discovered that there's some numerical features, or he, he discovered some oddities in uh, the book of John when he read the first uh, chapter where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So uh, he, if you read it in the Greek, there's a, a the that is added um, before the last God, and it pointed him to the fact that there, there are some numerical... Um, what do you call it, uh, design that is evident from the, from the Word of God. And he then began to study this phenomenon and in the end he devoted 40 years of his life unpaid, about 16 to 18 hours per day in studying the Word of God and uh, looking at the numerical design that exists in the Word. And this is quite important because it, it provides us with a lot of scientific proof that our Lord was able to uh, preserve His Word letter for letter. If there was one letter missing from the Word, you would never see this design coming out. And this, this is not the only thing. In the early 2000s, I uh, began to study the ELS, or the Equidistant Letter Sequence Phenomena, um, which is also uh, something that I'll show you in a bit, um, how that works. But this is also a very important aspect because it's another layer of authent uh, authentication that the Lord has built into His Word. And this basically works on the principle that you would have the, the written text of the Word of God and you would then, at you know, equal distances from each other, look for words that are hidden in the text at those distances. And you would expand on that, but I'll, I'll show you as we get to um, this in a bit. In, in 2010, I was invited by my cousin to attend a conference where a very well-known um, Christian apologist was talking about, can man be good without God? So it took him about an hour and a half to get through the, uh, the talk. And I was a bit disappointed because once you understand how reliable the Word of God is, uh, it becomes much easier to trust what it says. So if the Word says that, you know, all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, you don't have to take an hour and a half to, to understand it if you know that the Word of God is the truth. Um, and that led me to, or the Lord then inspired me to write a book called Factual Faith, Belief Founded on Truth. And you're welcome to download this. It's free, freely uh, available uh, on the internet. You can just look for that, for that name. Um, and in, uh, in this book, I basically look at some of the beliefs in the world today, especially things like the evolution theory uh, and how that compares to what the Word of God tells us. And, you know, even if you believe in evolution, the... It, it all boils down to a belief system. Um, I'll, I'll get to that as well, but it, there's, no, there's no proof really that evolutionists can provide to say what happened 6,000 years ago or 7,000 years ago because they're not able to, to investigate it properly. They don't have the ability. So it boils down to you know, what you believe. And uh, if you've got enough people believing in something, then it becomes a theory. So, but anyway, that's, that's how it boils down to And it was quite interesting that Sir Isaac Newton in 1642, to, who lived in 1642 to 1727, said about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. And that is so true today. There are so many people that you know, prefer uh, a traditional approach to the Word of God. They are not open to what the Lord promised he would reveal in the days of the end. And, I mean, his words are, are really ringing true today. So if we look at, at the scientific method, just to show you some of the uh, limitations. As an engineer, I've, I'm very well familiar with 
the scientific method and also its limitations. So the normal process that would be followed is you would define a question. So you would observe something and say, okay, you know, what, what is it that I want to prove? Uh, then you would start to gather information. Um, you need to understand your subject in such a way so that you would know how can you, how can you test uh, or perform tests on it. Uh, then you would form a hypothesis, and a hypothesis is a scientist's best guess at how that subject would respond to tests that would be performed on it. And then you would do your experiments, you would analyze the data, you would interpret the data, and then you would publish and retest. Um, if you analyze your data and you see that what you or the tests that you've performed are actually providing you with inconsistent results, then you may want to adjust your hypothesis because obviously your first guess at how the subject would respond was not accurate. So, and this is the process that they would normally follow, uh, but it does require you to be able to take samples. I mean, if you want to gather information about something that you'd like to test, excuse me, you need to be able to observe what it, uh, that which you want to test, as well as, you know, if necessary, uh, take samples for that. So if I asked you, you know, how do we prove that there were no dinosaurs on the earth 5,500 years ago? How would you go about doing that? Um, the limitation is that a scientist cannot move around in time. So the, the, for us to be perfectly able to, to validate that question, we would need to be able to go back 5,500 years ago and make an observation. But we cannot do that. So what scientists do today is they look at the evidence that we find around us today that would indicate that there was life earlier. Um, and what they would do then is to make use of, of carbon dating. Um, this they uh, accept, or it's, it's generally accepted that, it's a, that it is a reliable method. But how do we know whether it's a, re a reliable method? All we have to do is take a living sample for which we know the age and subject it to, to carbon dating and it's been shown to be false. Um, you can take, I think they've taken a, a snail's shell, um, they've, ta they've tested this and it, they found that it was 20 to 40,000 years old and it was still alive. So, you know, those kind of um, aspects is, is quite important to consider. So. I mean, if you, if you can prove that today carbon dating is, is, is inaccurate, how can you then assume that it will be accurate for something that, you know, lived thousands of years ago? So not really very uh, reliable. Now that's also why we don't have the fact of evolution or the fact of the Big Bang Theory. Um, this is all just people's thoughts that, they, that, that they've put together. And in most cases, you know, they try to explain everything in a naturalistic way. You know, so how did things come about so that we don't have to include God as part of the, the process? Um, they also don't want to be responsible to God in most cases, and that's why most of the scientific community will sort of band together around a specific belief um, in which they would then argue that God didn't need to be part of the process. But when we understand that the Word of God, that He actually managed to protect each and every letter that we find in the Word and kept it in its place when we read the, uh, the original uh, Hebrew, Aramaic and the Greek texts. And we can scientifically prove that every letter had, has remained in its place because of all the patterns and all the numerical features that are evident in those books and writings. Uh, we, we gain a lot more trust in what the Word of God is actually showing us. And for me, you know, I would rather prefer to, to believe what the Word of God tells me than what uh, opinions of people um, would, would portray as, as the truth, which in most cases, you know, they've, no, they've got no idea. So and what is a theory? A theory is a, um, describes a general well-established law that is associated with a subject that, that is being studied. And, you know, even to say a theory of evolution is also wrong because there's not, there's not really th anything that's well-established. And uh, if you read Factual Faith, you'll see, I'll, I'll go into a lot of depth um, as far as that's concerned, but I don't want to do that now because we, we've got lots of other important things that we'd like to focus on today. 
So, as I've said, the Word of God contains built-in authentication. So it's similar to when you use currency. If you have a you know, 100 Rand note in your hand, you would like to know that you actually have real money in your hand and not a, a, a copy that somebody made. Because, I mean, you could get in trouble if you tried to buy something with that. And a similar thing is, is true when, there's, when you see a watermark, when you hold a 100 Rand note up to the, to the sky and you can see or to the sun, you can see there's a, a watermark, you can see there's a, a metal strip in there, there's some fluorescent aspects that if you put it under a black light, they, they start to become visible. And the same is true for the Word of God. And what is important is if we look at Matthew 5 verse 18, we see written, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So, if we consider God's word to be true, we should then be able to test this uh, statement that Jesus made. And we can actually do that. So, the fact that we see these patterns in the word of God that rely on each of these uh, letters to be in its place, uh, as soon as you move one of those letters out of place, then all of it fall, falls apart. Um, what Panin did was he studied most of, or he devoted most of his life to the study of the numerical features in the New Testament, and there are others that have uh, devoted study to the patterns and design and codes that are found in the Old Testament, so we can see that both have been inspired by a supernatural being who lives outside of um, space and time. <coughs> and just to have a look at some of the features uh, about the genealogy of Jesus, um, the number of words in this uh, seven-word passage is 161, that's seven times 23. The number of vocabulary words is 77, or seven times 11. Six Greek words occur only in the passages and never again in Matthew. These six Greek words pertain precisely 56 letters. Seven times eight equals 56. And what is interesting is that each book in the New Testament contains specific words that are only used in that book. And that also has uh, a feature that it's a multiple of seven. So this feature of seven that, that spans through the entire New, New Testament is, is evident. And if you take one letter out, it's no longer valid. So in that sense, it gives you a lot more confidence in the fact that what the Word of God is showing us is actually the truth, rather than to re rely on opinions of people. Um, if we look at Genesis 1, uh, it says the number of Hebrew words equals seven. So that is just in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That's... That's the first sentence. And this is the numerical design that is found in that only that little sentence. The number of letter, letters equals 28. It's 7 times 4. The first three Hebrew words trans translated, in the beginning God created, have 14 letters. That's 7 times 2. Uh, the last four Hebrew words, the heavens and the earth, have 14 letters. Again, 7 times 2. The fourth and the fifth words have 7 letters. The sixth and seventh words have 7 letters. The three key words, God, heaven, and earth, have 14 letters, 7 times 2, and on and on it goes. I think there's more than 30 uh, aspects that, that Panin has, has identified in just that one sentence, of which I've only listed 10. But it shows you that there's definitely a design aspect in the Word of God um, that becomes evident and which gives us confidence in trusting what God has, has, has written. If we look at the ELS codes... Um, just to show you how this works, I've created a little sentence just to, to demonstrate um, how this would work. Can you see a hidden code in that passage? Maybe not easy. So, I've now highlighted the, uh, every fourth letter, and then you can see it stands out. And that's basically how the ELS codes work in the Bible. And there are many of these codes that actually span all of the Old Testament uh, more than one time. So there's a, uh, a code about Buddhism which didn't exist when the, the Bible was written. Uh, so you can see whoever uh, penned or inspired the, the writing of the Word of God also or knew what would happen in the future and what beliefs and uh, you know, religions would, would appear later on. And this code is, is, has a length of 108 characters, 
it spans the word uh, of God nine times. So you basically go through the, the word of God at long intervals uh, so that it basically wraps around all of the Old Testament nine times. And it describes Buddhism and, uh, you know, the fact that 108 letters is also part, uh, I think that number also means something to, to the Buddhist religion. It's a, it's a very important number to them. But it's, it's quite interesting to see that all these hidden codes are, are you know, hidden in the Word of God. The, I think the longest that was discovered so far has got 296 letters. And it's about Shimon Peres, who lived or who, who died a few years ago. Um, and it's got many sentences. I think the, uh, there's, there's a, lo- a long code about Mel Gibson, who made the, uh, the Passion of the Christ movie. And the code that is extracted from there, if you just take like this Read My Code passage that I've shown you, here, if you study that again with some more codes, you find 13 different other codes also related to, to Mel Gibson. So there's so much depth in the Word of God that uh, is um, reliant on the design that, is, that has gone into it, that there's just no way that this could happen if, 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 it, if the book was full of errors and if this was not inspired by God and kept uh, intact you know, over the years that, is, that have passed. So uh, I think it's really important to know that you know, we've got a book that, uh, that contains the absolute truth um, and we have to understand what it says to us. Uh, and that is what, what this all comes down to. Just to show you what an ELS code would do in the software that would be used, you would put in a search term, and that is uh, shown in this little, or this red area. And anyway, what will happen is that you would put in a search term, you would find a specific word at a different skip or you know, uh, an interval, and then you would find different words that would cross it. You can also extend this to see if you can read anything further if you understand Hebrew to see what else comes out of it. So, you know, they would, for instance, search for a pattern like, uh, say, Shimon Peres, somebody's name. And then they would see, oh, it actually says more if you continue down the road with the same uh, interval. And they established that the, there was 296 letters that, that uh, made up this, this specific code. Now, many people will say, no, Bible codes are, uh, you know, it's, it's a feature that you can find in any book with substantial volume. It's not true. Um, you can, if you consider statistics, find words with characters of between 8 and 12, which is statistically probable. But to find a code that is specific to a person living today, uh, that is 296 uh, letters in length, it's actually a whole par- paragraph with a number of sentences in it, that is just totally unfounded to say that you know, it's, uh, it's something that you can discover in every book. So definitely not, not true. Our Heavenly Father's opinion on, of His Word. So in Psalm 130, 138 verse 2, He says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. So if our Heavenly Father magnifies his word above his name, shouldn't we do the same? Uh, When we compare men's uh, doctrines with the word, you know, who do we trust? Can we really trust what men are saying rather than what God is saying? You know, I've been told by uh, people that I've committed intellectual suicide by, you know, disregarding what science teach uh, in lieu of what the word tells us. So, and, and I'm f- completely happy with that stance. You know, people can tell me what they want. I, I, I don't really care about their opinions. But uh, I think, you know, the, the importance of understanding the word of God and the truth that is contained therein, once you do that, your relationship with your, your Heavenly Father changes as well. It, it's not just a book that you consider to be full of errors or, you know, it doesn't match what science says. And as, that, uh, you know, as a result, I don't want to look like a fool before people. Um, I don't mind to be a fool for, for Jesus. He's, uh, he died for me. So, I mean, that, that makes him worth me trusting him. So, uh, and that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, also, when we 
understand some of these patterns and uh, that, that are evidence or evidenced within his word, uh, we, be, we begin to see that there are a different understanding that, that comes out. The, it's, it's not just the, the surface passage that we, that we read. There's different layers of understanding within the Word of God that we also have to uncover. And I'll go into a specific part of this. And, you know, uh, I think much of what, what I'll tell you today is something new. You, you may not have heard some of these uh, or some of these things. Uh, all I ask is that you also uh, act as those in Berea it says, um, as in Acts 17.11, these were more noble than those in Thessalon Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So whatever information I convey to you today, I don't want you to believe that I have the truth. I just, I just share with you what I have read in the word of God. I ask you to go and read the word of God yourself. See if what I say is Written, uh, is written there and whether it match because I do a lot of matching one passage with another like a puzzle I'll, and I'll get to that as we continue as well um, so the approach to my approach to the word of God and maybe just to give you a bit of background of how this came about uh, one of the fascinating passages in the word of God is Revelation 10 verse 4 uh, and let me just read the passage. It says, And when the su seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now this was always fascinating to me, because we know that the book of Revelation is where God is revealing things to us. But in this instance, he tells John, to seal up what the seven thunders said. And I was always frustrated about this. You know, why? Why would the Lord tell us about the, the seven thunders and that they actually said something, but then tell us, no, you know, don't, don't or tell John, no, don't write, write it down. And, uh, you know, I was always, it, it really frustrated me and I, I couldn't understand why he would do something like that. But then he showed me that there's a similar instance that happened in the book of Daniel. And if we read Daniel uh, 12, verse 8 to 10, we see a similar instance to, to what Daniel was told. And, he, and, and Daniel says, And I heard, but I understood not. And then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So this is, uh, this is where this whole discovery of what we will be sharing with you today uh, began. Um, it was a, born out of a frustration. Uh, for I wanted to know more about what the Lord wanted to reveal to me. Um, how, how does it reveal something to us when he's sealing things up? We, he should actually be revealing to us what, what was said in the thunders. I still don't know what the thunder said, but it is revealed to me that he makes use of patterns in the word, uh, in the word and that he um, uses you know, the, the word of God like a, a, a puzzle that you have to put together. And when you understand that there, that there are patterns in the word of God that you have to look for, there's a lot more rich understanding that you obtain from the word of God when you approach the word with the understanding that there are patterns that I have to look for. For instance, if we look at the, the first resurrection, which I'll, I, I think I'll touch, touch on a, a bit later, in Revelation 20 verse 6, um, it says, you know, blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. So if you just read that surface text, how do you bring into account the fact that Jesus was resurrected with, uh, you know, after his crucifixion? How does that fit in with what is written in Revelation 20 verse 6 where uh, it's spoken of the, uh, the first resurrection. And, you know, you have to understand the, the harvests of Israel to understand that because it says Jesus was resurrected as the first fruits and every man in its order. You know, first Jesus as the first fruits and at his second coming, you know, the, the other. And there's also a bit of information left out of that second part which you have to understand by 
cons considering the feasts, uh, the, the harvests of, of Israel. And the harvest consists of your first fruit, the main harvest, and, and then the, the corners the, or the gleaning that, that's left out to the poor. So once you, once you bring all of this understanding to the word of God through the patterns that he's provided, then things become more clear to you. You, you gain a new understanding of, of what, he's, what he's showing us. And it's, it's quite amazing when you, when you discover that most of the word of God you know, is written in such a way that it only provides a little bit of information in each passage that you read. So you may think that, you know, it's, it's no, I won't say it's wrong, but if you read the, the Bible from cover to cover, there's a lot of information that you, that you gain by doing that. You, you understand the, the chronological flow through the Word of God. You understand, you know, a lot of history as well. But there are a lot of information that, that are hidden in the Word of God that you need to approach by seeing the Bible as a you know, as, as puzzle pieces that you throw out um, on a table. Um, I'll, I'll get to that as we continue, uh, but that, that's just something that I'd like to make you aware of as well. <clears throat> so, when we approach the Word of God, there are a lot of patterns that, that repeat, and, you know, if you approach the Word with the intention to go and find the patterns, it, it, it really opens up a new world of understanding for you. And I, I'll, I've got some good examples that I'd like to share with you today. And I think this will also show you how it is possible to know that what, what is done in the heavens also forms part of, of what is written in his word. So here's the example of the first resurrection. Um, so let's just read through this. Revelation 20 verse 5 to 6. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, verse 20, when we understand that we have to, uh, you know, how do we understand the first resurrection? What is, what is meant by it? And how do we bring into account what Jesus, uh, or how his resurrection fits in with the first resurrection? Uh, one, Paul explains this to us in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, where he says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But, if, but every man in his own order. So it tells us, you know, the first resurrection is not just one event. There's an order associated with um, the first resurrection. Christ, the first fruits. So take into account that we're dealing with a harvest pattern. We have to understand how the harvest functions. And afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. And we also need to understand that afterwards, you know, there's two, two more harvests that remain. It's the main harvest um, that the owner of the field will have to harvest. And then there's also the corners of the field that are left to the poor, which the owner is not allowed to harvest. So it's, uh, when you look at the, the tribulation period, it, it makes so much sense when you, when you begin to understand these, these concepts. Um, if we look at Exodus 23 verse 19, it tells us, uh, I'm just amazed at how often the, lead, or the number 23 comes or is, uh, is evident in these passages, but you'll see as we, as we continue today. <coughs> so in Exodus 23 verse 19, the harvests are explained to us. And it says, the first, uh, the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of thy Lord thy God, Thou shalt not, not see the kid in his mother's milk. So this explains to us that when we have a harvest, the, you know, when the first of the ripe fruits are available, you take that and you take it to the house of the Lord. It is also a very small portion of the harvest, probably the smallest of, of all. Um, and this is also where the bride comes in. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a small portion. Uh, Leviticus 23 verse 22 this explains to us the rest of the harvest and it says, When you reap your harvest uh, of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field. So it explains to us that there are uh, two portions that remain after the first fruits were taken. And when thou reapest, thou shalt neither go, uh, thou uh, gather any gleaning of thy harvest, thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So. The, the Word of God explains clearly to us how to understand the first resurrection once we understand that we are dealing with 
harvests of Israel, of the pattern that is established within the harvest, and by applying this pattern to what the first resurrection uh, entails, it becomes more evident of what is meant in Revelation 20 when um, John writes about the first resurrection and those that are part of it. So, there's one passage for me when I approach the Word of God that is really paramount. And that is Isaiah 28, verse uh, 9 to 10. We, uh, Isaiah writes who, what the Lord says, Whom shall I teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So, and that is that is where the the mysteries of the word of God comes in. As we, when we look at the word as a, a, you know a, a big puzzle that you've taken, you've you've thrown it onto a table. You know, if you study the Bible, when you've thrown, if you consider it to be a puzzle that you've thrown out on the table, um, not put together yet, it is like if you read through it chronologically, it's like taking each piece of that puzzle. And you're studying it in detail and then putting it next on a, on a new pile next to it. And once you've gone through, you know the pieces of the puzzle, but you don't know what the, what the full picture is yet. And that is when you apply uh, Isaiah 28 verse, verse 10 specifically with the understanding that our Lord has written His Word with here a little and there a little, and you, put, you, you approach it as a puzzle that you want to piece together, then is when you uh, receive a key to open the mysteries that is hidden for us in His Word. So I've been studying the Word of God with this approach for about two years now, and it's just been amazing the the things that that He's revealed to us. And I think it's also you know only in the the past few decades, I suppose two decades, we we've had tools to actually approach the Word with this uh, understanding that it's that we can actually look for puzzle pieces with software that, that's available. Um, so I'm going to show you a, an example of, of some of the, the mysteries that we unlock when we do it like this. And I think, you know, this is a, such an amazing discovery if you, if you read the word in this, in this way. So let's take the, the passage of Daniel 12, verse 8 to 10. And this, this is now linking it to that uh, mystery that was locked up in Revelation where, uh, you know, God said to John, seal up what the, the seven thunders said. Uh, and we're going to look at the, the same instance that we've got in Daniel. But in Daniel's case, you know, when Daniel wrote these words down, uh, we know that the Lord promised him through Gabriel that specific information will be revealed at the time of the end and the wise shall understand. So uh, there were more books added to the Bible over time, and we'll look at this a bit later as well. Uh, you know, this, we need to understand the progressive revelation that God allowed through the creation of His Word. So, you know, at, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but maybe I'll just give you a quick, a quick overview for now. When Moses received the law from God on the Mount Sinai, um, the Psalms weren't written yet, the prophets weren't written yet, the New Testament weren't written yet, so Israel didn't have knowledge that we have today. We have all of God's word, and in Revelation 22, He told um, John to, you know, to add to to that passage. Nobody should add anything to us or take anything away. And by saying that, we know that He has completed His word. And whatever we have now before us, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is God's completed word. And whatever we need to find or search for will come from what, whatever is written. But Israel, when they were in the, uh, the desert, didn't have that luxury yet. Um, they didn't know uh, all the, the mysteries that were revealed to Paul and to John and all the apostles. <coughs> okay, so let's have a look at um, unlocking the mysteries that come from Daniel 12, verse 8 to 10 by applying the approach of looking for patterns and puzzle pieces. So in Daniel 12, verse 8 to 10, it says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. 
And it's quite important to look at what uh, Gabriel tells Daniel there. He says the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So we need to look for something to do with words. We need to look for the fact that something is sealed up. And we need to understand what is meant by the time of the end. And also the fact that only the wise shall understand. Um, fortunately, we have very uh, good software today, like eSword. I don't know how many of you use that. It is, it's really it's almost the only thing I use these days to, to study the Word of God because you can find so many things that you never thought of by just doing searches for specific terms or words that you're looking for. So what I did when I read this passage and I thought, oh, let's see what... If this is a puzzle piece, you know, and you've got specific areas that link into this piece to other pieces that we have to fit, you know, we normally on a puzzle piece you've got two little uh, cavities and two little uh, protrusions, if you can call it that, that you have to fit into other pieces. And here we've got the words closed up and sealed, end of, uh, end of time, and the why shall understand. So... How can we fit other pieces into this to give us a better understanding and to put together the picture that we're looking for? So if we look at Daniel 9 verse 24, this is a, a very rich passage as well in my opinion. Uh, Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So which prophecy and vision was Gabriel referring to here? So and this is the first clue to us to understand what was really sealed up. Uh, the information should then be contained in a vision and a prophecy that we have to identify in some way, and also to understand whether, you know, is this really the, the correct vision and prophecy that we've identified? So we need to find something that can assist us with doing that but it's already you know one additional piece that we can add to the the ones that we already have um, and where should we look for understanding and how do we know that we are actually living in the the end times um, you know what can we do to tell whether um, we are actually finding ourselves in the the end time and obviously all the answers that we Searching for, for will also come from the Word of God. So let's see what else is there. In Proverbs 25 verse 2 it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. So this is, also has to do with, you know, when God hides something. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that will say, no, don't, you, don't, you don't want to dip too deep, uh, dig too deep into understanding the hidden mysteries of God. But... Uh, he says, the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So, you know, it's God's glory to hide something for people that are really searching for answers in his word. Um, it's not always immediately evident by just reading the word of God from cover to cover. You have to really want to understand what he's saying. And by doing this, you, you receive more knowledge of, of, of what he is hidden in his word. So in this aspect, we've got um, two aspects mentioned, that God conceal a thing. Um, when God conceals something, it has to do with his glory. If you, if you take what he says in this passage, the glory, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. If we then go to Psalm 19, verse 1 to 4, it says to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the, of the world. Now can you see how all these passages are beginning to, to come together? So, and this is just amazing. I mean, uh, there's such assurance in, in what we are busy discovering by approaching the word in, in this manner. So Daniel 12 tells us that the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And Daniel 9 says, seal up the vision and the prophecy. So we know that the words are contained in a vision and a prophecy, which will be understood at the end time. 
And in Proverbs 25 says, the glory, of, the glory of God conceals a thing, and the heavens declare the glory of God, uh, and their words to the end of the, of the world. So by just combining these four passages, we already see that whatever was sealed up is contained within a, a vision and a prophecy. It has to do with the heavens that are declaring the glory of God, what, which was concealed, uh, uh, or which God concealed. And the words, or whatever they speak, uh, will be understood at the time of the end. Does that make sense to you? Can you, can you see how this fits together? So we, uh, the only thing that we really need to do is to know what questions to ask, you know, to get to this understanding. How do we, uh, how do, how do we take it further from here? Um, Let's go to the next slide. So, if, if we ask ourselves, you know, are we living in the time of the end? Is there anything that has come to light in, in our time that was never shown to, to people before? Um, you know, that generations that lived before us never had any knowledge of. It, it is the fact that God uses celestial signs to mark his feast days. And I think you will be, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with the, the blood moon tetrads that occurred during 2014 and 2015. Uh, this is a, a rare celestial event uh, during which there are four total lunar eclipses in a row. And these fall on Jewish or the Lord's feast days. Uh, and during the past 2000 years, there were eight of these. Seven of them only had lunar eclipses, and they were normally associated with Israel. So if we look at only the two uh, previous events before 2014 and 2015, there, were, there was one around uh, 1948 and 49, and that is where Israel uh, got their land back. And then in 67, 68, 1967, 1968, that's when they got Jerusalem back. So you can see that there are significant events that are associated with Israel that are marked by um, these celestial signs that fall on the Lord's feast days. And before our generation, there was nobody that realized this. Or the technology, uh, I suppose they didn't really notice it when it happened. Uh, but with the technology that we have today, there's a lot more than that we can discover by, by looking at these signs. And what is really interesting is that in the 2014 and 2015 um, series, there were also two solar eclipses, one on Nissan 1 uh, and then one on Rosh Hashanah uh, 2015, which didn't... Uh, the solar eclipses did not occur in any of the previous seven, uh, which also fell on uh, Jewish or the Lord's feast days. Um, and this really makes this series of events extremely unique. And for me, what this basically uh, tells us is that the Lord un unlocked the understanding for us about the fact that we have to look at the heavens to understand when he marks his, his feast days. And uh, this is a sign given to us to understand when he will return as well. You know, so the, um, going from this, this approach, this is where my study began to see, okay, how does, how does this all fit together? And I came across this information in around 2012. I was watching a few videos, uh, and I think at that time there was some speculation about the December 21st, 2012, you know that fizzled <laughs> there was nothing that happened um, but at that point you know we were, I was just interested in, in seeing you know how does prophecy match what's what's happening in the world around us today and I came a, across a video by Scotty Clark of ERF Ministries uh, in which he discussed this sign which at that point was still yet future and the fact that we had a solar eclipse marking Rosh Hashanah, which is basically the next feast day that, that is said to be fulfilled. Um, you know, in, at that point, I was then focused on, you know, could this possibly be the return of, God, of our Lord on the 13th of September in 2015? Uh, so 
at that point, obviously, we didn't know yet uh, the detail that we do today about the Revelation 12 sign, which is what we are going to discuss today in a lot more detail. Uh, but this opened up our understanding in, you know, to realize that the Lord has is, is, is not only given us His Word, but He's designed the cosmos around us in such a way that it would actually match what is written in His Word. And it shows us you know, how powerful and how awesome He is by you know, planning all of this right from the start. You know, if He said that He created the, the sun, moon and stars on the fourth day and the earth on the first day, then I trust Him. He did that. You know, he did not create the, the sun first and later the earth came. That's not what the Bible tells us. So that, uh, it tells us that you know, right from the beginning... He had in mind what he's going to write in Revelation 12. And he's given us signs in the heavens, or he's planned those signs in the heaven to show or to, to prove his, the prophecies that would be written in his word over a long period of time, uh, yet future at the time when he created that. And uh, this is just amazing to me. And this is you know, what, what I love about the, the word of God. There's so many mysteries in there that we can find when we, um, when we look deeper into his word. So, we understand then that the, the feast days of the Lord are uh, found in Leviticus 23. They are, we've got two seasons of feasts, the spring feast and fall feasts, or autumn feasts. And they, uh, the spring feasts are, feasts are uh, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. We know that these have already been fulfilled by, by Jesus. He was the Passover lamb, he was the unleavened bread. He was the first fruits unto God of those uh, who are dead and who had faith in the Lord. That's also quite important to understand, which I, I think I'll touch on a bit later. And then also uh, Pentecost, or the, the outpouring of His Holy Spirit over us. The four, uh, the four feasts, although there have been instances of um, very important events that happened on these dates, uh, we haven't really seen some of the prophecies or the descriptions given to us by Paul specifically telling us that, you know, at the last trump, uh, at the, the day and the hour that nobody knows, those who, who will be uh, raised from the dead together with those that are still alive who will be changed. And I think, you know, this is something that uh, God is marking for us at this point. And I'll, I'll show you also how that, that comes to light. Um, so what about the, the blood moons and the fact that he, he marked this uh, for us in Genesis 1 verse 14 we read that God had assigned a specific purpose for the sun, moon and stars and in Genesis 1 verse 14 he says and God said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And you can see the order, the order in which they were created, uh, or the, in which they were purposed, I should rather say. Uh, let them be for signs first, not for days and for years. Let them be for signs and for seasons. And the seasons, if you look at the Hebrew word there, it's, it's moed or the moedim. And that is the appointed time. So it means that he created the uh, the heavens, the stars, the moon, and the, the sun to act as uh, markers that would uh, point out his appointed times. And that's, this is exactly what we see in the, uh, the series of 2014-2015 uh, blood moon tetra that occurred. Um, and many would say, you know, this is uh, not safe to, to look at because this is astrology. Uh, it is not astrology. I can guarantee you that. It is, it is like telling somebody that if you're going to look at your watch, you are dabbling in fortune telling. It is not true. You are only looking at a marker. So God is, uh, is the creator of the, the heavens above us. He has given us, uh, his word uh, tell, uh, tells us that the markers in the heavens are actually giving us words to understand. So we have to understand what it's telling us and what it's saying to us. And if we look at what Genesis 1 verse 14 says, it says that you know, they have been created for signs and for seasons firstly, not firstly for days and years. So it's very important that we understand what 
the seasons are that they are uh, supposed to be marking. And this is initially, you know, when you see the 2014-2015 the signal, the fact that you have lunar tetrads as well as solar tetrads, uh, that goes into uh, some of the prophecies in Joel 2 verse 31, I think, um, where it says, Before the, the fearful day of the Lord, I will, uh, the, soon, uh, the sun will be darkened and the moon will be turned into blood. And this is a fulfillment of that prophecy because he's marked his feast days with both the moon and the, the sun being darkened on those days. And it's quite interesting to realize that... Um, when you look at the pattern that was given to us during Jesus' birth, uh, he sent the, the sign before his birth, also three and a half years before Jesus was actually born. And this is exactly, if you take the first uh, blood moon that occurred in 2014, all the way to where the Revelation 12 sign is fulfilled, it's once again three and a half years, which is, which is really important to, to, take, to take into account. <coughs> So this is basically um, how I understand the, the heavens above us. It is God's timepiece to us. So similar, uh, similar to how you would treat a, a watch, you would have a dial. Um, and that is the, the Maseroth that he's given us in the, the heavens, which we know as the constellations. Uh, the sun would act as a, an hour uh, hand. The, the planets or the moving stars would act as minute hands and the moon would be a second hand. And if you, if you look at the alignments that the Lord describes to us in his word and you apply these, this, this understanding, you can see how things begin to make sense. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into a lot of this in more detail in some of the next sessions that we'll, that we'll have. So what have we learned so far? Uh, a specific understanding of God's word um, is, is, has been sealed up until the, the time of the end. It involves a specific prophecy and a vision that we still have to identify, and we'll go into that in a lot more detail in the next session. Uh, we also know that the understanding of, of that prophecy and vision should come from God's timepiece, you know, the, the, the signs that He's given us in the heavens and the words that they, that they speak um, and that will be understood at the time of the end. Uh, and it involves this... Uh, the, the Lord's feast days as well. So we have to, to look at that as well and see, see how do we understand what he's done in the past to what he's going to do next. Um, and in the, if we look at Joel 2 verse 30 to 31, uh, the Lord right, oh, told Joel, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So what have, what have we learned so far? Our Heavenly Father has sent us a warning about what is to happen. And we read this in Amos 3 verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth, he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And that is what... Uh, he's, he's, he is such an amazing God that we serve. He reveals his secrets to his prophets before he executes them. You know, there's nobody that will ever say uh, they were caught by surprise. It is only the fact that they harden their heart against the message which would cause them to be found in a situation where they uh, are found unaware, you know, or uh, by surprise. You know, when the Lord said he will return as a thief in the night, it is for those who are not prepared to receive the word that he has spoken to us. Those who are are uh, awake, those who are desiring understanding of his word and understanding of the times will know even the hour, in my opinion. So I will, I will show you that in, in the next session, uh, or the next two sessions. In the next session, what I will cover is the, we identify which vision and which prophecy was sealed up. We'll look at some of the information um, that, that, that are associated, associated with that. We also validate how it is possible to, to confirm that the, the, the signs in the heavens actually match visions and prophecies that the Lord has given us. And then we will look in more depth into the information, or go into more depth into the information that was sealed up and what it tells us about the, the, the time before us. 
So I hope the first session was a blessing. I, I hope that it, uh, that it provides you with some tools on how to uh, approach the Word of God in a new, new manner or new fashion. And that it will also, when you do it this way, that it, that it will break open the Word of God to you and that it will reveal to you new mysteries as it has to me. And I mean, it's just amazing what the Lord has hidden for us in His Word. And yeah, thank you very much for, the, for attending the first session. We'll see you in the next one.